Tonight we are doing the Thursday program in collaboration with the Royal Art Academy in Stockholm. And uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce the Professor of Architectural Theory and History, Peter Lang, who will be moderating us tonight. Welcome, Peter Lang and the Royal Art Academy. Uh, thanks, Patrick, and um, I would like to thank you, Skisunis Museum, and um, all of you for coming tonight um, for this rather experimental um, <coughs> evening. Uh, we have, um, as our talk is on the subject of the fake, the false, and the fraudulent, coding and uncoding public monuments in contested spaces. <clears throat> oh, Got to be careful about that. And um, today, uh, well, we have with us, of course, uh, on our panel, um, we're going to have uh, Patrick Amsalem, who is the director of this museum, uh, Johanna Gustafsson first, uh, artist in Stockholm, Alessandro Petty, who has just joined the Royal Institute of Arts faculty as professor in architecture and social justice, and uh, Joanna Bratel, who is an artist and landscape ar uh, architect here in Malmo. Um, and I am uh, the moderator for this evening's discussion. Uh, so uh, I would just like to say that uh, <clears throat> Patrick, if I just do a brief introduction, Patrick has been the associate curator of photography at the Brooklyn Museum before he took this, uh, uh, came over here. Is there a problem on the... Sorry about that. Um, Joanna Gustafsson first. Um, I would like to actually uh, say that um, she just had announced that she's winner of the Modern Museum, so the Moderna Mosaics Sculpture Prize for 2017. And I'm really honored that she's here for us today. She lives and works in Stockholm, and she holds a master's in fine arts from the Royal Institute of uh, Fine Arts in Stockholm. Is that, it's the old man, right? Okay. And then we have um, <clears throat> Alessandra Petti, as I said, an Italian architect, artist, and educator who has been based um, for many years in Palestine. And um, he has joined our faculty, and he's also... Um, the director, uh, co-director with Sandy Hillal of the uh, uh, DAR, which is Decolonizing Architecture Art Residency. And um, finally, we have with us Joan, uh, Joanna Bratel, who's co-founder with Karen Anderson of uh, the group Disorder, so who will be um, also leading a tour of Malmo tomorrow morning for my students, but it's open for anyone's participation of the monuments of Malmo. In the upcoming discussion in Loon um, here, uh, uh, which is a co-sponsor between Schizernis and the Royal Institute, we plan to assess how deception in the public sphere... Is that... Uh, well, one day we'll figure that one out. I, is, maybe it comes in at the right times now. How deception in the public sphere uh, becomes an alternative version of truth. It seems wherever we go these days, physical history is misrepresented, whitewashed, or dubiously erased. When considering the subject for the Schisserness, whose collections of public art projects is unrivaled, the question that should be raised is when can uh, the fake be authentic? When can the false be true? And when is the fraudulent more convincing than the real thing? This is not so much the Benjaminian question on the origin of uh, original work of art in the age of reproducibility, as almost everything today is simply untraceable to some mythic origin. Rather, it's like if the digital, 3D digital scan swished across the smartphone uh, using some Google, Google app 
depicting an artifact recently pulverized during a drone attack in some undisputed, um, you know, place of war. I mean, it's impossible to really say where things began and where things are ending up. Um, <clears throat> and just to, for, for an example, I wanted to th pull out this uh, particular monument, which was built overnight in Budapest on July 20th, 2014, um, uh, which was under guard from the moment it was put up. It's the monument that portrays, as you see here, the Archangel A A Gabriel and the um, uh, eagle above portrays the occupation, the Nazi German occupation. And this is what happened within 24 hours. A, another counter monument was put up to um, oppose uh, this one. And uh, the reason why there's such a fierce debate about this monument is because this idea that uh, the Germans were the sole uh, oppressors in Hungary during uh, the late part of the Second World War uh, completely whitewashes the Hungarian fascist participation, this group called the Black Arrows Party, and their enormous role in um, especially uh, the hunting and, uh, uh, I guess, uh, removal of the um, uh, Jewish populations from Hungary. We're going to move <coughs> to our next speaker, Joanna, and um, I think you're set up. Yeah. Thank you. And also, the sound is working. It's great. So, first of all, uh, thank you, Peter and Patrick, for inviting me. Really happy for this. So, the two works I will focus on today is a work called White Pillars and another work called The First Stone. They are both low-budget projects and in terms of uh, my projects or my uh, practice sh kind of short projects. And I like them because they are sort of handed by me. And I see them as monuments of the invisible structures that create and maintain the public. The first work, White Pillar, was a temporary monument to public infrastructure that was immediately assimilated by public life. The first stone created a channel between two widely different public environments where the channel revealed differences in a city. But uh, I would like to start today to talk about Rodin's piece, The Burgers of Calais, as you see here. Uh, that has meant a lot to me. Rodin was commissioned by the city of Calais to make a monument over Eustace de Saint-Pierre that was the first burger to volunteer to give his life to say louder wow okay yes i can to save the city of calais from starvation five other burgers followed him and rodin decided to make a monument that emphasized the group and not the one leader as the commission was formulated so rodin wanted to claim the collectivity of the act he also refused to put the monument on a podium with the idea to create a feeling of closeness to the audience. The hero can be any body. This ideological shift made in physical form early made an impact on my practice that I see as a slow stuff-based performative or activism-based that practice that takes part in political discourse and the meaning and uses of public space and injustices in society. The red flag to the left is an example of how this shifting space and meaning is part of my practice, even when it's not made for public spaces. Whoop Whoop is made of a textile that has fallen from a window in Stockholm, where it was a private person's protest against the demolition of Slussen in central Stockholm. Whoop Whoop manifests a thinking about transition between spaces for political act and representation. And also is kind of showing the act of killing it can be to make a political gesture to an aesthetical. Whoop Whoop is a kind of trophy, and by that 
in another space is making a different kind of politics. So um, now I will come to this white pillar that I will uh, start focusing on. The work White Pillars was especially made for Möllevångstorget in Malmö. It was part of an exhibition, Society Acts at Moderna Museet, in 2000 to 2014. A central tenet of my practice is that I use the amplification um, of the different relationships between the bodies, the audience, the object and the spaces as my material often with an open story in connection with the relationship between the individual, society, groups, and how these relationships materialize. I am occupied with how and when society, that should be something that softly holds us, transforms and becomes totalitarian. And how the blurring between private and public space is part of the erosion of this holding. So when I use this expression holding, I refer to social security, schools and daycare, how a road gets fixed when it's broken, etc. And um, I know that Sweden is an example of a welfare society uh, in a global perspective, but from my point of view, being born here in the 70s and seeing the differences that has been uh, happening um, in the 90s, this is of course something that is very uh, urgent to me. So, I wanted to create a piece that enhanced a functioning public infrastructure to remind on what we have and should not take for granted. Something that carried and embodied a process of action in and with society. Um, Andreas Nilsson, the exhibition's curator, suggested that I could work with Möllevångstorget in Malmö. And Möllevång, and I know you all know this, but <laughs> I say it again, is an area which is the subject of gentrification and at the same time a center for political activities. It is the place where people gather to march for a demonstration. The square is an open space with benches and trees along the edges. The large, unprogrammed surface as its center is a space for meetings, conflicts and friction. At one side of the square, a monument is placed, the Honor of Labour, by Axel Ebbe. It depicts figures holding up a granite block with a bronze relief, relief of Malmö's uh, skyline. In the daytime, market traders sell vegetables and flowers, and at night time, it's open and airy. The square is surrounded by high lampposts. I decided to work with three of the ten of them, and three 12-meter-tall pillars was constructed on them. It was important that they would stick out as individual gestalts and coincidences, while simultaneously being grouped together. I wanted them to be seen as something that slowly crept up and multiply, uh, multiplied invisibly. They were constructed from white laminate with a perfect surface at the beginning of the exhibition, but just after a few days began to crack and swell and got covered in posters and scribbles, and a fast and tropic process was created. White pillars in general are to me um, symbols for power, weight, oppression, institution, but also for sustaining maintenance, insistence, and stability. So I see this work as a temporary monument reminding us that the condition of the public infrastructure is a material indicator of politics and issues of justice. By lifting the lamppost at the fore and at the same time hide them, I wanted to remind on that Society's politics can be read and in its park, benches and lampposts, the thing which almost invisibly ensure that the urban space function. So, during the construction process, I borrowed a flat near Möllevångstorget for a couple of weeks. And this is really uh, at the core of my practice that I want to stay for a long time. This, as I said, was only for three weeks. But for example, in Husby, I have been working for five years. And uh, in Karlskrona, where I'm working now, I have been 
doing it for one year and spending one week every month and really being as much as part of the place as you could be as a kind of outsider. So for three days, three of us were working intensely at the square, two up in the sky lift doing the construction and one on the square. That person made sure that people wouldn't get hurt if we dropped something, but mainly to answer questions and to discuss the work. We spoke to over 100 persons. The conversation centered on the square, public space, ownerships and politics. And the reactions could be split into three main categories. The first reflected a fierce suspicion that we could would erect commercial advertising space and, and was careful to point out that that was not wanted at this specific square. Others suspected that we were mounting surveillance cameras and they knew with absolutely certainty exactly where the existing cameras on the square was placed. And the third category were convinced that we were putting up communal notice board, finally, which they would soon be able to avail themselves of. So, one part of the process was then to find out a solution for the dissemination of the work. How could we communicate that the pillars were art and that they were part of an exhibition at Moderna Museet? I also had works within the exhibition at the museum, but I mean, this title society acts, I cannot only be in the museum. So, so I did it with signage and text, but the declaration of the pillars as art became a limitation to that plasticity that I wanted them to have. If I had put a sign on the pillars with a title that referred to the exhibition, they would have become reduced to advertising pillars for the museum. So they actually disappeared by being proclaimed as art. So I decided not to do it. So I wanted to leave the square in peace and then the pillars needed to be just as open as the square where people's doing and beings created the square. The pillars became an extra crevice for interaction and they became graffitied and were used for postering. Many people didn't notice them because they were, became a materialization of the urban life around them, hence constantly changing. So here is, I think, day two, and here is the end. And here is um, a gathering around it, and then at that time they started. And I really like this image because it shows how this piece really was shifting between different positions. So this camouflage method I use is something uh, that means that the work I do sometimes can appear as very different, but on the contrary, they, uh, to camouflage means to adjust to the specific conditions that are embedded in the situation. The second piece I will talk about was produced for Through a Glass Lightly, a project in the Mall of Tensta, a suburb in Stockholm. It was curated by Dorota Michalska and part of the exhibition Frederick Kiesler, Visions at Work, annotated by Celine Condorelli and six student groups at Tensta Konsthal. Kiesler was an Austrian-American architect, theoretician, theatre designer, artist and sculptor, and he was really engaged in how art could become uh, active and a live part of public life. And he wanted mm, artists more to make exhibitions in shops, for example. So this project was to investigate how could we do this um, this time. Um, so opposite to the strategy, um, uh, um, and. The method I used in this piece was totally opposite to the strategy of white pillars. To signal that the piece was a piece was at the core of the content. And I will come back to that later because I want to start here. Uh, since we are at Skissena, I would like to start in the beginning of the process. So I found this concrete block at Djurgården in Stockholm while taking a walk the same week as I got invited to participate uh, in the project in Tensta. 
The concrete block has been part of one of the king's oak and was a way to carefully mend the tree after being striked by a flash. The method did not work and the trees spit out all these concrete blocks. So there's a group of oaks and these are these concrete spit out blocks around it. And here we can see how it was used. You could see the further down here, it's still the concrete, and then up is the new technique where you actually take the bark from the falling down pieces and glue it together. So this takes a long time, and uh, I mean, they spend a lot of time to take care of these kind of monuments. This oak is called the Prince Eugene's Oak. And here is a map with Tiensta and Djurgården marked. The average income in Tensta is 284,900,000 9, kronor. And at Djurgården, the average income is 574,900,000. Djurgården is land owned by the king and is a park with art museums and cafes with ecological food. It is a place for pastime that represents the final cost for the surplus of the upper class. Tensta is known for being a socio-economically problematic area. Young people throwing stones at police and buses is part of the main media coverage. If you Google Tensta, images of police and violence comes up. And this is, of course, part of the problem. Media that repeat and uphold this image. Tensta Galleria is a place with an ongoing everyday life. But at the same time, it is also a substitute for a public space. Tensta Galleria is situated close to Tensta Konsthall, and if you compare their program to one of the museums at Jurgården, you really get worried about the lack of critical discourse in the area. We should all go there and work. So, what I did was that I took this concrete block and transported it to Tensta Galleria. At Djurgården, it was part of a story where nature can be seen as a symbol of power exercise, a nature cultivated for practical, aesthetical purpose. I wanted this tension between the two sides to take shape in a physical object and via the work create a channel between two different by capital established and maintained environments that wears a costumes of being a public place. In Tensta Galleria, the concrete block became a work of art. The transport from Djurgården to Tensta was a symbolic gesture and the naming as well. The title did two things. It points toward the possibility of revolt and the question of guilt, who actually threw the first stone. But it was also an act of fake authenticity that claimed the right to history and thereby the right to change history. And as you see, to, um, I use signage, um, to use signage was really at the core of this work. I made a sign that told the story and used this small museum fence to mark it as an artifact. Yes. Thank you. I think you are very generous. I hope that you still have some energy to follow this very interesting conversation. And um, I was thinking also, I'm always in these occasions trying to build up on different arguments. So I was very glad, um, you know, trying to add something um, in this very moment. Um, because listening a little bit, of course, from the very beginning, some of the very fundamental questions came a little bit into my mind in relation to the discussion that we are having tonight, um, but also in relation, for example, specifically with the uh, work that have been involved uh, in the last 10 years in Palestine. Um, I guess one fundamental question that I want you to keep a little bit in mind, and then I will hopefully it become clear in the way I will try to 
to tackle this, this question is um, who decides what constitutes actually heritage? And attached to that also who has the right actually to narrate, the power to narrate a story. I'll take you now in maybe a, a little bit a different place from where we are now. Um, this is a picture of the Haitia refugee camp. It was taken in 1953. This was just uh, three years after um, Israel was established and two-thirds of the Palestinian population was expelled. In the case of the Haitia, most of the people were just a few kilometers, just on the other side of the border. Most likely, this is maybe the image that you might have in your mind when you heard or imagine what is a refugee camp, which is this assemblage of very precarious tents. However, in the case of Palestinian camps um, that have been established now almost 70 years ago, when you ask this very simple question, what is a camp? Um, the image of reality is this one. So in some way, there is um, a gap between what we understand and what maybe is the common understanding of a refugee camp and the actual reality. What is in between is history. So if I go back to, to the question, what constitutes heritage? And in this case, what is the history that passed between this moment, which was 1953 and 2017? When you ask this question in the camp, things get very complicated. They are complicated, first of all, from let's say, international agency that, of course, always understood the camp as a temporary spaces. Despite the fact, in front of you, you have something that looks like rather permanent. Even if you use the, if you apply the Palestinian law for preservation, some of the structure that UNRWA built in the 1950s, they should be protected. They should not should be just demolished. So first, there is a, a negation of history that comes from uh, international agency and more generally by, let's say, states that, of course, the last thing they would imagine is to recognize what actually they have created as a space of exception which people that live in them don't have the same rights of people that live in a normal part of the city. But also, the history is, this history is negated by the community itself, by the refugee themselves. Because if you recognize that 70 years have passed, you recognize most likely that this is not a temporary space, that your right of return, that is described in international law and uh, humanitarian law, uh, will not take place. So the way to engage in this reality, um, as you can understand, is uh, deeply complicated. And it's complicated especially in relation to any possibility of uh, engaging, even simply understanding what is this that is, that is there? Is, that, is it a city? Is it um, a camp? In some way, it looked much more like a city. These are concrete houses. People build them because, you know, after the first years in which there were only tents, they start to struggle with the idea, if, we are not, if I'm not going back, you know, uh, tomorrow, I need to protect my family from, you know, very cold winter that can happen in this part of, uh, of Palestine. And from this very beginning, we can only imagine the painful decision that people have when they had to decide they had to build a roof. These were conversations that are registered 
in the uh, memory in, of the families in which every single architectural element was incredibly politically loaded with the right of return. If you believe in the right of return, why you are fixing your house? If you believe, and if someone asking you where you come from, you, you will never say the Hesha, you will say the city that are today part of Israel, why you engage with any form of architecture? In that sense, architecture is the ultimate enemy of refugees, because architecture has to do with permanency. Architecture has to be on you settling down and being comfortable. And very importantly for refugees, also means normalizing what was originally built as an exception, as a temporary solution. After 70 years, this creates a condition of permanent temporariness which is a condition that, in fact, I would argue, is radicalized in the camp. But if you think, also in partially the experience that we have in some of our cities, in which people that live in certain situations which the gentrification will try to expel them, or the welfare state has been dismantled, that sort of permanent temporariness it's a larger condition that is more and more uh, permeating a um, vast part of society. So there is a knowledge that exists in the camp that is a knowledge that is always dismissed. And it's always, as I said, it's not dismissed only by the academia or is dismissed by the international organizations that, of course, wants to see only refugees as the victim. How a victim could even have a history that is only the history of suffering. There is no history that can be acknowledged that understands refugees as political subjects that are not just victims. These were most of these questions were somehow for us very fundamental to start to engage with. Um, this why in 2012 we establish a university in the Haitian refugee camp that is called Campus in Camps. Um, it was very clear for us that the first thing was for us to start to give names to things that actually we were experiencing. Everybody knows we're there, but there were no um, definitions, there were no words to explain. For example, if you describe the camp or look at that space that I just showed it to you, how, how, you, how do you think you can somehow navigate a space that doesn't have any private or public? Um, how is organized? There is no municipality. So there are a lot of questions that somehow are central in order to understand how the society self-organize, you know, in this very tragic uh, initial moment, but also there was an incredible um, production of different social structures, of different political thinking, that in a way um, can open up also a different understanding of how we can imagine the relation between space and territories and communities. Here, of course, I don't have a lot of time to um, go a little bit more in details of um, what we produce um, as a collective dictionary. This was a dictionary that was done together with participants of campus in camps that choose certain specific uh, words that uh, had a specific meaning that were kind of close to understanding what was the kind of reality um, that people were experiencing and also I would say what we can learn in general about refugee camps. Here just a very um, you know, brief example of the word al-masha, which is in Arabic can be translated as a common, but in a way it, it was a word that was trying to make sense of a very simple question, who owns the camp? Because the camp originally were just space carved out from state sovereignty, and de facto in some cases, of course, uh, this is the way it is, and this is the way that allowed the states to actually deprive people of their rights, because if this is their territory and people live in them, 
There is no reason whatsoever why that people should not have the same rights of the other people. So the only way to do that, that the state carved out, say this is a, an exceptional condition, this is temporary, so temporariness become a political tool. Um, and this is how somehow a kind of suspended space is created. So it's definitely, you would not say that the camp is a public space. I would argue it's, it's even the it's opposite, because if the public space is the space in which rights are recognized, and you know, we heard, you know, and also we, we are used to think that, for example, squares and public monuments are in fact the embodiment of these rights, the camp is almost its opposite. It's the monument of non-rights. But also, at the same time, is not a private space. Despite, in the camp, you have homes that people actually built. But these homes, you cannot claim as yours. Because there is no private property. There is no place where you can register that this, these things that you, the money actually you build, with which you build these homes, uh, they are yours. And we only understand this only when a camp gets completely demolished. Um, so, if you destroy the camp, one could argue it's the demolition of the demolition. Because in a way, it's also created conditions which there are projects, for example, like the one of Nahr al Bared when it was destroyed. This is a camp, Palestinian camp in Lebanon. And uh, UNRWA, which is the United Nations Relief Agency, uh, wanted to rebuild. The question was at that time, these houses, legally, they should not be even there. So what, what, what you are going to rebuild? You give them back the tents? Of course, people didn't accept it. So in some way, implicitly, they were forced to rebuild the camp as it was, as it was, in fact, an old city in Europe. It was the same, so people gathered together, decided how many rooms each house would have, and they rebuilt the camp as it was. And in fact, we understand this architecture only when um, stopped to exist. These are just some images um, of a project that we started three years ago, filling up the UNESCO application for declaring the Hesha as a World Heritage Site. I will not have here the time just to uh, go and explain a little bit more um, the content of this. But of course, how you can imagine was also um, trying to engage with these questions of who decide what constitutes heritage, going into, into it and, and try to argue and try to document that actually the camp does have history. And that history is actually particularly important, not only for refugees, but also um, for normal citizens. And maybe I would like just to finish with um, another project that was, of course, part of the, of the conversations about monuments, symbols, and different uses. So all this discussion, I remember very clearly all this discussion with participants in campus in camps, get to the point that uh, there was a sense of frustration to, to say how that, in a way, is built into form. How this discourse, something that maybe in a very imprecise way I I'm trying to describe, um, could be understood when just a person walk into the camp. So one of the essential elements that I was describing is, um, is the tent. And the tent remains a very strong symbol uh, in Palestine which is not only, of course, associated with the time at the beginning of the refugee camps, but also is associated with political struggle. Every time there is a political event, there is the tent that is put on where actually people can gather under the tent. But that was one side of the story for us, because that was, let's say, if you like, um, the mainstream narrations that refugee would use. And maybe it's already there. But maybe the role of 
an artist, an architect, or an intellectual that is somehow interested not only to, to please or, or, or to use participation as, as a kind of way to look for consensus, but also to understand the project as a way to pose some questions, to make contradiction explosive. For us, it was very much um, trying to build the fragility or the image of the fragility of the tent with the concrete house. And um, making a sort of hybrid um, between a concrete house and a tent. Um, and trying this way to also not only, um, in that sense, entering a very dangerous area of, of trying to, to think that as a monument. And the only way to avoid that for us was that this remain a place for gathering um, for the community and a special time, which is the time where you have the city, the, the lights that comes from the city, but the refugee camps remain dark because there, are no public, there is no public uh, illumination. So there was also the idea of engaging in this particular time, which is the time of the night, uh, in which several discussions um, can take place. Maybe I'll stop there. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Alessandro. And our last speaker, Joanna Brattel. Exactly. Oh, it's working. Perfect. Oh, <laughs> right. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you, Peter, for having me. Uh, I'm going to bring the discussion back to Malmö and Lund uh, for a bit. So my name is Johanna. I'm a landscape architect. Uh, I work with a lot of different projects, but for example, I'm running an architect collective called Disorder. We work with everything from large-scale urban planning processes down to temporary installations. Uh, our main focus lies on power structures within the built environment. Uh, at the moment, we have a lot of projects in Malmö, which is where I'm partly based. Um, so Peter has asked me to come here today to give you a few local examples of uh, contested monuments. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some examples from Malmö, as well as one from Lund uh, and Malmö, I guess most of you have been there. Uh, it's only about 20 minutes from here. It's also only about 25 minutes uh, from Copenhagen. So in many ways, Malmö is much more connected to Copenhagen than it is maybe connected to Stockholm uh, in many ways, uh, which our first statue is a good example of. Uh, and this one, you know already, you know the story. Uh, this is Carl Gustav, the king who took Skåne from Denmark and made it Swedish. So he's the reason we're standing in Sweden right now uh, and not uh, Denmark. Um, you heard the story before. I can just add some uh, details. Uh, this statue was actually, the idea behind the statue was an idea of brotherhood. So the people behind this statue, who were mostly the novelty of Skåne at that, that time, in 1896, uh, they didn't see this king as a symbol of Swedish aggressiveness. Uh, they saw what he did uh, as the first step towards Nordic unity based on natural borders, which in this case then is the water between what is today Sweden uh, and Denmark. So the original idea was an idea of brotherhood, but of course, as you heard before, this idea was more or less lost uh, from the very beginning. Uh, I can also add the fact that this statue is a bit different from other statues of its kind, uh, meaning a man on a horse. Usually a man on a horse in a statue is something in motion. Uh, while this statue, the horse is clearly standing very still and the king sits very heavily in the saddle as sending out the message that he's come to Skåne and he's come to uh, stay. Uh, I can also add that in the 90s there was a strong debate about removing this statue uh, and it was because of a politician from the right-wing party. Uh, he compared this statue to statues he'd seen on Stalin uh, and he wanted the statue removed and then he met some resistance from with his own party uh, and then he said, well clearly these people are not from Skåne. 
In the end, it was suggested that the statue, more or less as a joke, was removed and placed in Karlshamn instead, which is another city in Sweden. Uh, in Karlsam, no one really got the joke. Uh, instead, the politicians, they were super happy and super enthusiastic about the idea, and they said, as long as Malmö pays for it, bring the statue over. Uh, yes, uh, and when talking about kings and being in Lund, uh, for those of you who know Lund, uh, a famous king, uh, King Karl XII, used to live in Lund in the 18th century. Uh, and then in 1853, it was suggested by a professor at Lund's University that the death day of this king should be celebrated in Lund. Uh, and it was some sort of uh, tribute to this uh, king. Um, so this professor, he gathered a group of people next to this statue, which is at Tegnerplatsen here in Lund. Uh, and Tegner, he was a writer who wrote a tribute poem uh, to Karl. Um, so this group of people, they gathered around the statue, they read the poem, they read some other poems, uh, they sang some songs, and that was the start of the celebrations of the death day of uh, King Karl XII. And those celebrations continued on. A lot of the times, not that many people actually showed up in the end of the 19th century. They had to stop the celebrations a few times uh, because radical students thought the French Revolution should be celebrated instead. Then in the 1930s, this king, King Karl XII, he came, became an important symbol for Nazis in Sweden. He was even so important that the Swedish-German Association of Sweden sent a small statue of King Karl to Hitler for his birthday in 1939. Uh, and then, of course, these celebrations uh, took more of a Nazi character, uh, which wasn't so strange. At that time, the largest association, student association in Lund, uh, was the pro-German nationalistic uh, association. And then after World War II, this uh, Nazi character more or less lingered on. Uh, then in the 80s, it took more of a neo-Nazi shape. Uh, and that's also when larger clashes between neo-Nazis and uh, counter-protesters, uh, anti-fascists occur. Uh, and these clashes continued uh, in the 90s. Um, in 1993, around 400 people were arrested in Lund, which I guess is a lot for being Lund. So then the municipality of Lund started to organize um, different culture events on this night. So they more or less booked the entire city, uh, and then the celebrations more or less stopped, nevertheless, in 2007. Uh, and in 2008, there were clashes between Nazis and uh, uh, anti-fascists once again. And throughout the time, since 1853, the starting point for these celebrations has always been this uh, statue. Also important to note, in connection to this statue, uh, some people say that the, the Swedish Democrats, who is the racist party in our parliament now, lay the foundation for their politics in Lund, uh, because Jimmy, who is the party leader of Sverigedemokraterna, he used to study with a couple of friends in Lund that are now his colleagues uh, in the parliament. And where do you think they used to gather? Well, they used to gather Next to this statue, between 1999 and 2003, uh, they used to read some poems. Of course, they read the Karl poem. Uh, they drank some glug, uh, and they had some gingerbread cookies. Uh, they were never more than eight people, uh, because then they would be considered a demonstration. So this uh, statue in Lund has seen a lot. Now, back to Malmö. Um, so if you want to leave a mark in history, you could either build a monument, you could also build some kind of monumental building. Uh, in recent years, we've seen a lot of monumental buildings being built in connection to redefining a city. Uh, the most famous example from recent times is probably Bilbao in um, Spain. You probably know the story. So Bilbao was a, an industrial city in decay. Uh, then the Guggenheim Museum was built in Bilbao, uh, and now it's a tourist destination. Uh, Malmö used to be an industrial city. Uh, then the economy crashed in the 80s and 90s. 
uh, for a long time, this was the symbol of Malmö. So whenever you would see the skyline of Malmö, this will be part of that skyline. The Kockum's crane. Uh, then when the economy crashed, this became some kind of monument of a collapsed industrial city. And the politicians were very eager to uh, ship it off to South Korea, which they did in early 2000. Uh, instead, Malmö got a new symbol, uh, which is this uh, turning torso, a twisted tower done by a star uh, architect. At that time, so we, uh, Malmö had a politician who was also an architect uh, and he really understood the power of this kind of monumental buildings in transforming the image uh, of a city uh, and this became the new symbol of Malmö and the new story of Malmö is the story of a city going from uh, an industrial city to a knowledge-based city and the latest addition in these kind of monumental buildings popping up in Malmö is Malmö Live uh, which is a concert hall, uh, a conference hall a hotel, a sky bar, and so on. It's called Manhattan by the architects because of the high-rise building. Uh, and it has received a lot of critique, mostly connected to economy and democracy. It was supposed to cost 600 million Swedish crowns. In the end, it cost a double. Um, it's supposed to be for all the citizens of Balma, but it's, of course, more targeting an economically strong culture elite. Uh, some say this con concert hall was just an excuse to build Northern Europe's tourist uh, hotel. Um, but of course, this is not the entire story of Malmö. There's different stories. Another story is a story of a segregated city, uh, of a city with high numbers of poverty and unemployment. Um, at the moment, I work a lot in a neighborhood that is not part of this official story of Malmö yet. It's a neighborhood called Rosengård. It was built during the one million program years uh, of Sweden. Uh, and a lot of people living there have an immigrant background. Uh, they're not super rich uh, or don't have that much power. So no one has really cared about Rosengård for a really long time. Now, in recent years, the interest for Rosengård has suddenly started to uh, emerge um, because Malmö is growing and Malmö needs to densify. Uh, and one area that's going to be densified is Rosengård. Um, so suddenly politicians, municipality, investors, landlords are super interested in Rosengård. The problem is uh, that Rosengård has a really bad reputation, mainly because of how media portrays Rosengård. Uh, and of course, Malmö wants investors to come to Rosengård. So how do you transform that bad image of a place. In Malmö, there's usually only one solution. Uh, it's called Kultur Kaspa. It's supposed to be the turning torso of uh, Rosengård. Uh, of course, the municipality hopes that this uh, Kultur Kaspa would lead to more investments in Rosengård which will then benefit the people living in Rosengård. Uh, this building has received also a lot of critique, especially from different researchers all over Sweden. Um, part of the financial model of financing this building is by selling out the public goods. Uh, so they've sold up, off a lot of apartments in Rosengård to finance this building. Um, it's also, of course, a danger of gentrification, so people have to leave their homes. Uh, another problem with this building is that it doesn't really have a content. Uh, so when you ask people involved, so what is going to happen in this high tower? No one can really answer to that. Uh, and when talking about Rosengård, uh, uh, it's almost impossible not, of course, to mention Slatan. So Slatan, the football player, he grew up uh, in Rosengård. And wherever you go in Rosengård, there's different references to Slatan. For example, you have his beautiful smile in mosaic in a tunnel uh, next to where Slatan grew up. And of course, it's been debated for a really, really, really long time whether or not to raise a statue of Slatan, uh, either in Rosengård or in Malmö. But then Malmö has a policy. Uh, it's not raising any statues of people still alive. Uh, because if you raise a statue of a person still alive, uh, that person might do things later in life you don't really uh, like. But Stockholm doesn't have that kind of policy. So now they're building a statue of Slatan in Stockholm, uh, four times his size in gold. Uh, and of course, not everyone is happy about that, uh, especially a lot of people in Malmö is not happy about that. 
uh, a few months ago I saw an interview with a football player from the local team in Malmö, Malmö FF. And he said, well, clearly this statue is going to end up in Mälaren because someone is going to try to steal it uh, and bring it uh, to Malmö. Uh, then my last example is this uh, point of view. It's probably the latest addition to the public art scene of, uh, of Malmö. Um, this was donated to Malmö by an art dealer. So Malmö got it completely for free. Uh, it is placed outside the art museum of Malmö, uh, Malmö Konstal. And it has received a, a lot of uh, critique. Um, First of all, it started a discussion on whether or not anything that is given to Malmö for free to be placed in the public space will be placed uh, in the public space. Then also the architects uh, behind this space, because it was redesigned just a few years ago, were not so happy with this uh, sculpture. Uh, the redesign of this space, it was supposed to be like an open stage for all the citizens uh, of Malmö, and it has quite a minimalistic kind of design. And also the art museum, which is just next to this, um, has also a very minimalistic design because it's supposed to be like once you enter the museum, that's where the magic happened. Well, of course, uh, this is the totally opposite of that. Uh, some people in the local magazine describe it as something sent down from outer space uh, by some kind of uh, alien. Uh, it also started an important discussion about who is actually able to manifest themselves uh, in the public space of Malmö. This was, of course, a male architect. Uh, and last year, in last year's guide to public art in Malmö, less than 25% of the artists in that guide were actually female artists. So, thank you. <laughs>